Thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's really nice to be here for my first time. So uh, let me start by giving some motivation. Can I use this board? Yeah, OK. Let's give it a try. So motivation. What we want to study are arithmetic groups. So my gamma is going to be an arithmetic group. You can think of SL2 of Z, or your favorite congruent subgroup, or SLN of Z. And uh, more precisely, what we want to study about this arithmetic group is its cohomology, say with complex, with, uh, complex coefficients. So we want to study this. Now, this is a classical subject, in particular for every p, for let's say almost every prime p, we have an algebra of operators HP. that uh, acts on this cohomology algebra and preserves the cohomological degree. And this algebra for almost all primes p, they combine well to, into a commutative algebra. And we can study this cohomology as a module for this algebra. And what we find out is that the same abstract um, module, the same abstract isomorphism class of module, happens in different cohomological degree. So our goal will be to study and find a reason for these uh, isomorphism classes to uh, appear in different cohomological degrees. So we want intertwiners between them. So we want to describe maps that go from the j degree to the j plus j0 degree. And moreover, we want them to play well with the algebra of operators that we had before. So the object of my talk, the spherical derived decay algebra, will solve this question. OK, so first of all, I want to, before moving on to the actual definition, I want to give a bit of a warning. Let me write this here. The warning is that I describe cohomology with complex coefficients for now. But in fact, we will need to pass to cohomology with torsion coefficients to construct our operators. And I will be more, more explicit about the reason why in a moment. Uh, and, but then we can go back to, say, periodic level by taking um, inverse limit. So we will work with torsion coefficients. So let me describe my setup. I'm going to take s to be my finite ring of coefficients. So this is, let's say, z mod p to the n, a finite ring of coefficients. I'm going to take g over f to be a connected reductive split group. And f, in this case, is a periodic field. I'm going to denote by g without the underlying its f points, and by k the points of the ring of integers, or just any hyperspecial maximal compact. And uh, OK, so in the, this is a classical setup. I want you to notice that we basically already moved on to the local setting. right? Here we were discussing for every prime p. Here we did indeed fix a p. So let me remind you the definition of the classical spherical Hecke algebra. So this can be described as functions from G to S, such that they are compactly supported and they are left and right K invariant. So for now, I'm going to denote this algebra by H, G, K. And the operation in this, in this model is just convolution. 
Now, this will be the objects that give us these classical operators preserving the cohomological degree. So we need to increase this to some sort of degree object, graded object. So first of all, let me move on to an equivalent description, which is more suited for introducing a grading. This equivalent description is just going to be the endomorphism algebra in the category of smooth G modules with S coefficient of the compactly induced representation from k to g of the trivial one. OK, so it's an easy exercise with Frobenius reciprocity that these two things are actually the same. And uh, operation here is just a composition of endomorphism. Now, now we're ready. We want to go into the, the right setup, so we need to somehow increase this to a graded object. So, so here's our definition, derived Hecke algebra. <coughs> if you think of this endomorphism algebra as just the algebra of Holmes between the induced representation and itself, then it comes fairly natural to upgrade the home to an X algebra And we'll take this to be our definition for now. So just to be super clear, I mean just the all the x groups for non-negative n. And I'm going to denote it in this way. So script h lower s, this is my ring of coefficients. And I'm going to put a star here to remind myself that it is a graded algebra. So. Uh, Sorry? You work in which of these I'm working with, I'm sorry, what? In, in which abelian? Oh, uh, smooth representations of G with coefficients in S. So, OK, let me write this down. So, this is my notation for smooth G modules with S coefficients. <laughs> OK, so let me make a few remarks about this definition. So the first remark is that if you recall how you define these sex groups, you, what you need to do is you need to replace your representation by an injective resolution, and then compute home spaces between these injective resolution. And this is very hard to do, so this is basically uncomputable with. Computable with. OK, so that said, we will give a, an equivalent description in a moment that is much easier to deal with. Now, the second remark I want to make is that this is a graded algebra over h0, which is a classical one. It's classical. It's with s coefficients. So somehow this, this p and this p will give us some interesting behavior, but it's still a classical object. Classical spherical Hecke algebra. OK, so the third remark I want to make is that in the context of mod p Langlands, Olivier and Schneider studied a similar object for a slightly different subgroup uh, than k. Um, OK, now. Now, um, the last thing I want to say before uh, stating the theorem is that uh, so the classical one, which I'm going to denote by h0 now, has a natural action on the k invariance for every smooth G modules. And uh, instead, this graded algebra will give me a, a graded action on the derived k invariance for every G module or even every complex of G modules.
So for instance, and it will, this will be very important for us, the degree one piece of my graded algebra, which sometimes I'll just denote by h upper one, will produce endomorphisms that raise my degree by one. OK, uh, now I'm ready to state the theorem. So I recall the title of my talk was saying uh, structure and application. So here's I define an object. I would like to study structure before figuring out what to do with it. So let me fix uh, t inside g and maximal split torus. And uh, let me take t to be the f points and assume that t and k are in good position. So this is a technical assumption that basically is guaranteeing that um, the intersection of k with t is a maximal compact of t. So let me also assume that the cardinality of the residue field is at least 5, and that p is large enough compared to, uh, well, compared to the degree of the extension and uh, some root theta. More precisely, it's the Coxeter number. So this Coxeter number, this is just a combinatorial avatar depending on the root datum of g, t. For instance, if my ground field is just qp, I literally just need p to be greater than the Coxeter number. OK, so under this setup, we have, so we have a degree preserving algebra map between the derived AK algebra of g, k into the one for t, t, k, sorry, t, t intersected k. And uh, so I'm going to call this S for Satake such that, so what do we have? Well, OK, S0 and S1, by which I mean S0 is a map between H0 and H0. This is degree preserving. And S1 is a map between H1 and H1. So both are injective. And uh, for S0, there's an explicit description of the image. And for S1, it's not as nice, but we still have a, let's say, a sharp upper bound on the image, which means that we can describe, so the image of S1 will land into H1 of t, comma t intersected k, and we can describe a submodule of this, which contains my image, and uh, at most points under localization for some character that uh, factor through S0, at most points, these two, these two coincide. So OK, I want to say that the S, since the H0 was a classical object, S0 has been studied before. So the S0, this is work of Herzig, and later Henniert and Wigner-Ross. So the, the real uh, meat in this theorem is really the degree 1 part which is what we want, again, to be able to produce these operators that will increase the degree. I'm sorry, uh, just about the line above, there are k invariants that use the cohomology. Yes. And, but you say it works for a kappa of g module. Is that obvious? Uh, I, I can't see. Which part? The complex. Complex, sorry. Uh, OK. Oh, so complex. OK, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's OK. Um, OK, now that I gave the definition and described the theorem, I want to give you a more concrete description of this algebra. So, so let me say a uh, concrete description. So I'm just going to state it as a fact. So h s g, k consists of uh, functions, so 
from pairs of points in G mod K into the direct sum of the cohomology of a specific class of uh, groups. So, so for every pair of points x, y in G mod K, we can form the stabilizer under the, under the diagonal G action. So this is going to be an intersection of two conjugates of K, in particular its finite index in each of the two. And we take the cohomology of this one as a profinite group with S coefficients. So functions like this, such that. So what we're trying to do, again, is uh, you see here we went from the function description to the, let's say, representation theoretic description. And we upgraded the representation theoretic description to the derived setup. But somehow we preferred the function description because it was very easy to compute with. The operation is just convolution. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to give a description that, are, that somehow builds up on the description as uh, equivalent functions. So my condition A is that on the pair x, y, f needs to be valued just in the cohomology of the corresponding stabilizer. The second condition is uh, supposed to encode this idea of being left and right k invariant, which is a condition of g equivariance for the diagonal action. So what I'm going to say is that if you act by g diagonally on the pair x and y, you should be somehow related to what happens at the pair x, y. Now, this equality doesn't make sense because by condition 1, they live in different stabilizer. But the stabilizer are conjugate. So I'm going to require that the conjugation induces a, an isomorphism on cohomology that gives me this equality, of course, for every g, x, and y. And the third condition is replacing the compact support condition in the following way. This condition tells me that on every g orbit on here, either f is 0 everywhere or 0 nowhere. So it makes sense to speak of support on orbits. And I'm going to require that f as supported on finitely many orbits. OK. Now, uh, again, with this description, the operation is convolution. It's a special kind of convolution because you will need to take into account that, again, the values of, of f at different pairs of points live in different cohomology groups. So there will be a bunch of restriction and co-restriction map to make sense of this convolution. But I would rather now write down the formula because it gets a bit long. Uh, OK. So now that we have this better description, what we really want to do is we want to understand the derived algebra of the torus. Because recall, the theorem was telling me that to understand degree 1 heck operator, it's enough, more or less, to understand the h1 of the torus. So what we want to do is we want to understand the one for the torus. So let me write this down as an example. So in my example, g is equal to t is a split torus. So um, t is tf, and k is just the points over the ring of integer. OK, so let's see in this special case what happens to my description up here. Well, t is abelian, so every stabilizer is just k. So every stabilizer is t of o. So somehow condition 1 and even the second line in the board disappears. What I'm looking for are just functions from t mod k times t mod k valued into the cohomology of my integral points. Now, condition B also becomes fairly trivial, completely trivial, because conjugation is uh, the identity. So what I'm saying is that this f is constant on orbits. And condition C is that as finite support. So using the equivariance, you move the element here on this side. And you are left with that uh, this is the tensor product of the group algebra of the co-character co lattice tensored with the cohomology algebra of the integral points. So, so this is much more explicit than most kind of description that you can hope for 
for the one for g and k. In particular, you read the cohomological degree from here. So degree 1 heck operators will be, let's say, um, sum of simple tensors where the cohomology, the cohomological tensor is just a hom from my integral point of the torus to the ring. And, uh, and this is just a group algebra of a lattice. OK. So before moving on to the applications, I want to give a, an idea, at least a sketch, of how uh, one defines this map S. Um, so the expectations about higher degrees is that we don't know if the map is injective. Uh, we understand this one again very well, thanks to that description. Uh, but this one, not as well. In particular, if you look at this description over here, and then you use the Cartan decomposition for G and K, it turns out that uh, do I want to write this down? Let me write this down here. As a module, my h of gk is just the direct sum for these uh, elements in the Cartan decomposition of the cohomology of k intersected gk g minus 1. So again, this is a cohomology of a finite index subgroup of your maximal compact. And uh, in degree higher than 1, it's they are sort of computable, but it's very hard to understand, to understand them. And uh, in particular, in this description, which is very nice as description as a module, the multiplication operation is fairly obscure. So we can't say much about what happens in degree larger than 1. Yeah, so I was saying I want to give an idea of how one defines this map S, which is uh, this derived Satake homomorphism. So. OK, so let me, re let me recall. Um, one of the many equivalent ways of defining this attack homomorphism in, in uh, degree 0. So in degree 0, let's say Hersting defines a map from h0 gk to h0 t, t intersected k. Hersting is working with uh, fp bar coefficients. So not exactly our setup, but uh, the same map will work with fp coefficients, for example. And the way he does that is he takes a, a left and right k invariant functions on here. He needs to get a function on the torus, which is um, invariant by the maximal compact. So what he does is he averages over, uh, over the unipotent. Of course, this requires the choice of a Borel. But. So that's his average. f is completely supported, so only finitely many terms of this sum are non zero. And uh, if you're familiar with the classical Satake homomorphism, the one over C, you'll notice that we're missing the modulus character of the Borel. But we're forced to do that because this modulus character is going to be a power of p, and we really don't have powers of p with this type of coefficients. So, sorry, this is uf modulo uo. So u is the unipotent radical of a Borel containing t. So I'm assuming I picked compatible uh, models over the ring of integer. OK, so the slogan for this is, let's say, integration over the unipotent radical. And this type of slogan is actually fairly powerful. For instance, um, if you have an intermediate Levy subgroup between G and T, then you can define a map, an intermediate satake from g comma k to m comma m intersected k by the same slogan, integrating over the unipotent radical of a parabolic subgroup uh, whose levy is easier m. So, okay, using the same slogan, let me just say can be derived in the sense that I can upgrade this to a map for, um, for my derived decay algebra. 
And uh, I want to write it, to write the explicit formula just to convince you that this is indeed a good slogan. So let's say SF, I want a function on the Dirac algebra of the torus. So let me just say SF of um, T, T of O. What is this? This is a sum. Well, I'm going to again take my f of tu. But I need to end up in the cohomology of the torus. So first, I'm going to take the restriction from this tabulae there, common, the intersection of k and the tu conjugate intersected with the torus. And then I'm going to co-restrict up to the torus. And what I'm summing on are elements t, u, in b of f modulo b of o. b is, again, a Borel. But I need to take t of o orbits on this. So for every t of o orbit on, uh, um, on elements of this type, t, u, I take one representative, and I plug in this representative into this summand. And this is the formula. And you can see that we are still integrating over the unipotent radical in the sense that we fix t and we consider the whole fiber, the unipotent fiber above it. OK. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm considering a choice of Borel fixed from the beginning. Can I describe one? Oh, um, I haven't thought about that. Uh, I, I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, but uh, in the previous uh, definition, you had an implicit argument that the sum is finite because of the p orbits, right? Yes. And th that works here, too. Yes, so you need a, a separate argument to show that this is indeed well defined as a finite sum. Yes, I'm skipping many details under the rug. I just wanted to emphasize that somehow this is a powerful slogan that can be up upgraded. Even proving that that's an algebra map requires a whole different argument, which I don't want to go through today. OK. So. Uh, we describe the structure fairly well, in particular the structure of the degree 1 um, part of the spherical Lecky algebra. We've seen that we can identify it with elements uh, coming from the derived Lecky algebra of the torus. So now we're going to use this to study the cohomology of some arithmetic manifold. So let me move on to the applications. <coughs> so this time I'm going to take g over q for simplicity, to be reductive and connected. I'm going to take k to be the product of kp inside the finite adels. And uh, so this is open and compact. I'm going to assume that g of qp is split and that kp is hyperspecial, so that I'm in the condition of my local, of my local um, description. And I'm going to take y of k to be g of f modulo s infinity times g of af modulo k to be the arithmetic manifold. OK, and now. The cohomology of this arithmetic manifold, what I will say is z mod p to the n coefficient, is acted upon by my spherical Lecky algebra at p, again with z mod p to the n coefficients for every n. So I'm just going to write gp kp for my gqp and, and, yeah, and kp. OK. Now, now it is indeed the time to move on to the characteristic 0 setup. And I realize that I forgot to say why. So if you go back here, you see that these are profinite groups, which are finite indexed into the maximal compact. And these subgroups tend to have 
a commutator subgroup of a finite index. So that h1, which are going to be mapped from the abelianization to your coefficient ring, will be trivial if your coefficient ring has characteristic 0. That's why you really need to work with torsion coefficients in this setup. But now, now that somehow we're only interested in the action, so we're interested in the endomorphism algebra produced by this one um, as endomorphism of this one, now we can pass to the periodic setup. We can take the inverse limit in n and get uh, a ZP algebra of endomorphism of this. OK. And um, what, OK, besides passing to the ZP algebra now, we can also instead fix a Hecke-Eigen system in this cohomology. So let me take pi to be tempered cohomological caspidal representation uh, over a QP vector space. And let me assume that the k invariants are non-zero, which is telling me that pi appears in there. So this determines. my usual uh, Hecke character for the so this is a classical global Hecke algebra I'm going to put the 0 for the degree I'm going to I'm trying to use a t here so global classical Hecke algebra and I'm going to denote by chi the restriction of chi k to my uh, ec spherical Hecke algebra at p. Now, we study the pi eigenspace in the cohomology. As an action of the, of the localized derived Hecke algebra at this character chi. So more precisely, OK, so what we, we do is we want an action of this derived Hecke algebra localized at chi. OK, now we have to be careful because, again, this derived Hecke algebra is only somehow interesting with torsion coefficients. So what we need to do for our application is to consider Satake maps for every n. So I'm going to say Sn. This Tp is a, um, so let me fix T. This is a torus, maximal torus split at P. And Tp are the QP points of this torus. So for every n, we have this attacker map. And they are compatible under reduction, say, from P to the n to P to the m. And we, what we really want to do is we want to localize both sides at chi. So let's say at chi mod p to the n. But before doing that, again, we need to make sure that this character here actually factors through the degree 0 setake. So I'm going to put this as an assumption. So we're going to assume that chi factors through the degree 0 attack map. Oh, um, I, uh, well, my Hecke-Eigen system will uh, not necessarily be in ZP, but just in a finite extension. For simplicity, I'm going to take this to be ZP. It, the same reason why uh, later I will assume something on the Galois representation associated to pi. So this, this assumption on the chi is not a very 
strong assumption. It just means that chi uh, does not vanish on a bunch of elements in, the, in these uh, classical algebra for the torus. This is just the group algebra of the lattice. It is, it's an assumption known to people doing mod p langlands. It's the opposite assumption that super singularity. So, OK, now with these assumptions, Yes, so people doing Mount Pilanglans call super singular a character of this algebra that does not factor through any Satake map into any levy. So, OK. Now um, we localize. So we get a map from H1, V mod P to the N, GPKP, Cayenne into here. I'm going to call chi n upper t to be this extension to the, to the algebra of the torus. And um, OK, so this is compatible in n. So we take the inverse limit and we get a map from the h, I'm going to denote by h1. Zp, just the inverse limit of the z mod p to the n pieces of the derived key algebra. I don't mean the one with zp coefficients. So gp kp chi into h1 tp tp intersect kp chi t. So here comes the, the good part, is that we understand this derived key algebra for the torus fairly well. It's still here. And I'm looking at the degree 1 piece. So I'm looking when this star is just a 1. And now when you localize at your character chi t, what you're doing is you're killing these group algebra. So what you're left with, this will, again, assuming some regularity condition on my character chi, this um, collapses to just h1 t of zp in my case. Uh, with dp coefficients. So these are just homes from the integral point of the torus to zp, and we understand them explicit, extremely well. So the upshot, uh, assuming some regularity condition on the character, when you localize on this part, you're literally only localizing this at the character chi. So you kill the entire group algebra, only the s remains. Uh, you mean with my? Um, oh yes. So let's say with uh, with FP or FP bar coefficients, for instance, this is just a localization map of integral domains. So somehow, like you only have one possible extension. Uh, of course, if your characteristics d mod p to the end are not integral domains technically, but really, when you look at presentations, you only have one possible extension. Okay. So the upshot is that we get an action of this HOM TZP tensoring with QP on this, uh, what is it, uh, the chi, the pi eigenspace. OK. And what we want to do is we want to study this action. So. So I want to mention that in the related work of Akshay, um, what Akshay is doing is, is doing a very similar setup, but he's always taking uh, L not equal to P coefficients. So rather than using a single, a single prime P, he's using a collection of Taylor Wise primes. And uh, he ends up describing a very similar structure where rather than having the full integral point of the torus, he has a collection of uh, finite tori. OK. now. Uh, we study this action. In particular, um, the final goal of this talk will be to define a conjecture similar to the one that Akshay gives, which basically says that if this is a canonical integral structure, we want to find a, a reason why this 
purely piadic action will preserve it. So, uh, OK. So now I need to increase my setup. So let, let g check. I'm going to assume that it's actually over QP rather than a finite exten extension. This is a dual group. Um, of g. And uh, let rho the Galois representation associated to pi. Conjecturally, if it's not known, otherwise just take rho. Uh, OK, then we're going to assume that rho p, so the restriction of rho to the decomposition group at p, is crystalline and ordinary. And by ordinary, which is the condition that will come up more often in the rest of the talk, I just mean that there exists a Borel inside the dual group containing the image of uh, rho p, so containing rho p of Galois of qp. And we fix this Borel. OK. Now, uh, once we fix this Borel, we have that the adjoint representation of rho, the adjoint representation, let me just say, of rho p actually contains the Lie algebra of b check as a sub representation. Contains. I assume, I assume this exists. I so you're asking me if I'm using the L group or the C group? Is this? Yeah, so that's an assumption. Um, it doesn't matter for me, but I think it doesn't matter. I mean, I have to basically impose very strong assumptions anyway, such right. that, for example, I have to impose strong assumptions anyway, such that, for instance, yeah, it boils down all the way down to QP. You assume that. that uh, let me assume that it's it's connected. Okay. okay, you assume that the representation exists directly. Yes, 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 yes. I'm assuming it exists. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay, so this is a sub, sub the adjoint representation ad rho as, so this is a sub rep. And uh, this is, I'm going to denote it also by ad ordinary rho p. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to define a series of maps relating Galois cohomology to my homes uh, out of the torus. <coughs> OK. So um, OK, let's. So we take uh, T check. So the dual of my torus over there, I'm going to take it inside of B check. And uh, now we have an isomorphism between the homes out of these points into home from ZP star to the Lie algebra of T check. This is basically duality for tori. And uh, we also have a map so Caligari major denote this map epsilon, which is basically considering a, a an ordinary an ordinary deformation and is picking what happens at the level of the torus Now, if we quotient this map both sides by the crystalline subgroup, then so this is just H1 of QP, since the action of, on the Lie algebra of T check is trivial. So this is H1F 
of uh, QP. Let it check. So by picking a, a uniformizer, it turns out that this is just my home ZP star into Let check. By picking a, a splitting of QP star as ZP star times Z. OK, now. Um, Again, we will, we will be looking for maps out of this home, so out of this one, which are my degree one echo operators. We're looking for maps out of, out of it. So somehow what we need to do is we need to invert this arrow. And the easiest way to do it is to assume that it's an isomorphism. And this boils down to some condition on the Hodge state weights for the Lie algebra of the unipotent of B check. So we're going to assume that the Hodge state weights on Lee u check are all less or equal than minus 2, then let me just say epsilon is an isomorphism of QP vector spaces. OK, now remember the name of the game is to somehow describe a reason why the integral structure inside the cohomology of yk, assuming that pi is defined over q, so that it makes sense to, to localize and keep, sorry, the rational structure, and keep a rational structure. Uh, basically, what we want to, to do is we want to find a, a map from this to a space with a canonical rational structure. And this space will be a motivic cohomology group, the one that Kartik mentioned on his talk. So, we have a map so far, thanks, thanks to the assumption, we got from the degree one Hecke operator to this. Now we take, we simply embed it into uh, or rho p. We embed it into the full um, adjoint representation. OK, now thanks to the local state duality and the fact that the H1F in the local setup are annihilators of each other, this one here is isomorphic to H1F QP. And the state twist of the co-adjoint representation dual. This is QP duals. Now, OK, now since we want to relate that one to a motivic homology group, we need to go to the global setup. So from my H1F QP twist of the um, coadjoint representation, I'm going to take the dual restriction map into a global Selmer group. So for this global Selmer group, you want to assume the crystalline and ordinary condition at P. You can put other assumption on uh, a finite bad set of prime s. For instance, the set of primes s where your k v is not hyperspecial or where pi is ramified. So you end up with this dual Selmer group. Now, now this dual Selmer group will be related by a regulator map to my motivic cohomology group. So let me introduce the necessary setup. So two the coadjoint representation that is conjecturally associated a Chow motive. A, so M coadjoint, a degree zero Chow motive, weight zero Chow motive. And again, we're going to assume that this is over Q, not a finite extension. And uh, in particular, after Vavodsky, one has 
regulator maps and the one the regulator map that we care about is the one going from the h1 with the coefficient q twisted by 1 into the h1 q uh, coadjoint twist. So again, conjecturally, this is an isomorphism, I think due to Bailinson. This is an isomorphism upon uh, tensoring with QP. This is a Q vector space, this is a QP vector space. So and under this conjecture, I get a, a canonical rational structure inside this space. Now, remember, I was actually in the Selmer subgroup. So that's not quite enough yet. But um, Scholl has defined a, the equivalent, let's say, of the Selmer subgroup on the motivic side, which is this subspace of integral classes, Scholl. Let's see if I have it here. Uh, defined a subspace of integral classes, which again, the class in the motivic cohomology group that spread out a bit outside of our Q. And conjecturally, the relevant motivic cohomology group now maps inside the Selmer subgroup. And uh, it stays in, I mean, if this is an isomorphism, we also conjecture that this is after tensoring with QP. So we are ready now. We will take duals, take QP linear duals. And uh, let me write over here the sequence of maps that we got. So we started with this uh, home VP star into Lity check, which were my degree one hack operators. We gave conditions that the map in this direction was actually an isomorphism. <coughs> then this one mapped into the full uh, joint representation. And uh, by local duality, this was isomorphic to the H1F QP of the twist of the coadjoint dual. Then we took the dual restriction map onto my global Selmer subgroup. And now taking the dual of the regulator map, Mass me into that dual, which is now a QP dual. OK, and now the important thing is that this has a canonical rational structure. So conjecture, if pi is defined over Q, So that we have a rational, a canonical rational structure inside the pi eigenspace. Then the derived AK algebra action factors through the map above. and preserves 
the rational structure. OK, and uh, I think I can go here. So what, what kind of evidence do we have for this? Fairly limited. So, so in the case where G is, say, a, an isotropic torus, many of the maps that we defined, so remember, this is an anisotropic torus, say, over Q, but over QP, we still want it to be split. Anyway, more, most of the maps that we defined collapses. They're easier to describe. So in this case, one can literally check that the map from here to here, how it, how it works on, um, when acting on the cohomology. So we can check this. So this is true. And uh, the other part of the evidence is that the work of Akshay, uh, which constructed a similar sequence of maps, again, rather, rather than working with this subject, he has a collection of uh, finite tori coming up from Taylor Wiles primes. And, uh, and in this case, he actually checks that the action factors through this, this uh, series of maps. And you can still conjecture that the rational structure is, is preserved. Um, it's work in progress right now to show the first part of the conjecture, the factoring of the derived AK algebra action. Uh, can you explain? Yeah, that's exactly the point somehow. This action of the Hecke algebra, this is really constructed periodically. Like, uh, as I said, you need to start with torsion coefficients. So to derive Hecke algebra, you cannot do it with characteristic zero coefficients. That's why somehow it would be surprising that a purely periodic action still managed to preserve the rational structure, still knows about it. Oh, I see. So like you would like to know the pre-image of this rational structure in here. Uh, no, I, I can't. I haven't thought about that, honestly. OK, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs>